So, welcome to a new segment we're gonna try out. We'll see how it uh, how it will unfold. Basically, what we want to do is also cover the the life of of professional triathletes, not only me but also other guys. Um, I hope I'll have access to a couple of uh, of good dudes um, and beautiful uh, women on um, on the like world tour. So um, the first one, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna do kind of a, an interview style segment with is no other than uh, Big Mac, uh, Magnus Didliff. First of all, Thanks, thanks a lot for uh, for spending time with me. I know that can be a struggle sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I've, uh, a pleasure. <laughs> sometimes I've uh, I've really enjoyed the last couple of days. I think it's been it's been awesome, not only to um, train with you, but also um, I think one one thing that is kind of interesting is the fact that obviously the last couple of years we've been two of the of the hard hitters from Denmark. Um, and in many other countries that create some kind of uh i'd say unhealthy rivalry where uh, that's one thing i've never really felt with you because it's um i really admire the f the how you how curious you are on triathlon and training and the lifestyle um a thing you don't really find in another uh, in a lot of other athletes um and also how you're just a great competitor. Um, so it's been awesome to spend time with you. It's been um, very learningful for me as well. Um, and, and I hope we'll, uh, we'll do it again sometimes. Um, it's great because I think most of you think that we train together every single day just because we're from Denmark, both of us. But actually, that's not really the case. <laughs> no, <laughs> we, we, we see each other down here. Yeah, we basically only have trained together for more than yeah. <laughs> one session when we've been down here. Usually, we live at uh, two very different places in Denmark, so it's and also travel a lot all the time. <laughs> it's always difficult to find time, but when we are when we are down here, it's really easy to coordinate. Yeah, exactly. And as um, you say, I think it's if you look at some uh, like of the other big countries, like some of the Germans, you get the impression that they have never been able to train that much together. Mm. And it's never been like that with us. And I remember the first time uh, <laughs> I thought it was supposed to be like that actually yeah. before uh, we started training together so it was a big relief actually that to see that we can actually train together and learn from each other and not just uh, fight only on the like the race course of course but uh, yeah just to measure dig all the time <laughs> in training as well that's it that's not really the case so how this will unfold is kind of um, I've written a couple of questions uh, completely random to be honest, um, stuff like we want to we want to talk about some stuff that is not really the usual kind of podcast thing we we do. Uh, yeah, a lot of those, uh, and you can go listen to all the podcasts about Magnus, and you'll <laughs> hear the same story in all of them. So uh, that's not really what we're here for. And then I got into the triathlon at the age of 19 <laughs> yeah. and I started... Uh, oh. So then you won Roth. <laughs> <And then laughs> <I won that. laughs> uh. So first of all, um, Iron Man kind of threw a curveball today. It's uh, pretty interesting. You don't say. <laughs> it's um, it's a, no, October 12th today. Um, and we woke up to the news that Iron Man, they've made their own series. Um, what do you think of that? Uh, it's crazy to be honest. I uh, I woke up and I looked at my phone and I saw a lot of texts from my manager because he's in the U.S. So he had the news. He was awake when uh, they released it. Mm. And first of all, I think it's crazy that they've been able to cover it up. Like I knew absolutely nothing about it. And yeah. did you? I because knew nothing, and I I'm pretty sure a lot of like there was not a lot of people who actually do anything. I feel like every time there is big news coming 
the, some of the top pros, they usually know mm. <laughs> what to expect, but this was like completely out of nowhere. So it's, but I think it's, it's going to be interesting. Obviously, PTO has not released their full schedule of, uh, it's only mainly on like rumor basis what they are going to do. And mm. I think until they have actually released some more uh, concrete dates and what is uh, going to happen exactly, it's difficult to judge what direction everything will go mm. in because I can see, obviously, it's good to have a lot of opportunities for pro athletes and this is it's, it's, it's a good thing uh, eventually, but I can also see worlds where pros will have to kind of some will go on the PTO tour and some will focus more on Ironman and then both of them will kind of get a bit uh, if some of the best pros do one and the, then you don't really get the best competing against mm. the best so so you don't not, think you can do uh, both uh, you can do both but for instance with the what uh, if we look at what Ironman because that's the only thing that is <laughs> uh, written uh, what they really want to do PTO hasn't released yet they say that it's like the five races mm. you do that counts uh, and, and primarily it's and Ironman if you look at uh, how they have structured it it's uh, going to be like the three best Ironman races like full distance mm. races so that kind of means that you, if you want to win that one, you basically, as far as I can see, you need to do three full distance Ironman events. Yeah, we actually, we did some quick math about how it, ho like, this is very new. So obviously stuff can change. We don't, we don't know about that, but we did some pretty crazy math here. Um, so as it is right now, you would, um, you would have more points d doing 10th in Texas, Ironman Texas, 10th is in Ironman uh, Hamburg, 15th in Ironman Nice, 10th in 70.3 Oceanside, 10th in 70.3 Talon. Then you would in being first at Texas, first in 70.3 Oceanside, 70.3 St. George, 70.3 Salem Sea and 70.3 Worlds. Yes, because so you, Iron Man is weighted so much more. Exactly, yeah. and and that that whole thing just that's it seems crazy that you can win yeah. so many races but still fall short compared to just because you go like average or also below average in, in Iron Man races. Like if you win Kona, that was six thousand points, yeah. and if you win another Iron Man, no matter which one, it's <laughs> it's five. Yeah. So I think the gap from winning a regular Ironman to winning world championship race it doesn't award winning the world championships enough in no. my opinion so I can see some <laughs> some uh, some issues or mm. some problems but it's like but it's I, cool they it's have really a, good that they a circuit. and I think it's a consequence 100% of what PTO has done like the Agreed. Ironman has recognized okay there is a, a player on the market that's really trying to to do some some things and and they have reacted, which is uh, really good and what ultimately the professional athletes have been uh, wanting to mm. see. So it's a good step uh, in the right direction, I would say. Cool. So uh, from that, that was kind of a yeah. We basically just woke up to the news, so it, it's kind of. I interesting. think like generally until PTO has said what they want to do next year it's so difficult to say anything of how anyone will structure yeah, the okay. season now you have like even before Ironman released this I didn't know anything about my season next year now it's going to be <laughs> I really really don't know what how you want to prioritize yeah exactly yeah because you also have Challenge Roth there yeah exactly uh, which is a very important race for you yeah. especially so it's like and it's like a third category it's yeah. not iron man it's not pto but it's still like a very high profile yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah probably the biggest triathlon in the world yeah exactly so, um, so coming back to uh, to the questions we uh, we drew up i'd like to know what magnus did live would do or will do when he retires the sport of triathlon Ah. If you have to choose right now, I know a lot of things can happen, but uh. it's uh, difficult to, to predict. Uh, obviously, I have uh, like a university degree in chemical engineering, but to be honest, I don't think I would 
go back to to that. I think if I something happened that uh, forced me out of being a professional athlete, I would probably still be doing something that relates to the sport. Maybe still try to use my like the the methods you learn at university. For instance, I'm. I think it's really fascinating to dig into like sports physiology or aerodynamics or maybe more going into a, a very technical part of the sport and try, try to dig into something and become uh, leading in an area of, of helping other people in something like aerodynamics or mm. whatever. So specialize in a, in a very small uh, part of triathlon, not really, not really go into coaching itself i think it's more advising probably more more advising and something you can actually like really dig into mm. where i think probably you will find uh, people that are better at coaching other human beings mm. <laughs> than what i will ever be uh, or become <laughs> so so everybody kind of knows everybody who's watching this uh, kind of knows that you are uh, one of the biggest movers when it comes to aerodynamics. So um, I'd like to know what, like, what started that fascination about aerodynamics and that whole side of the sport. Because I think you, uh, obviously, there was some guys who who did it a bit before, but to take it to an extreme as you mm. you're doing, that must also take some kind of fascination about yeah, aerodynamics. I think I think for sure it comes down to my background uh, of studying uh, to become an engineer. You could say that what I was studying at university, we had ad absolutely nothing to do with actual aerodynamics, but more kind of the way you learn to think about problems and how the world behaves. There is a lot of stuff you can transfer into other areas of, for instance, aerodynamics. So I always have had the the mindset of uh, yeah, an engineer and then I I got into triathlon and I f could very quickly see that in order to go fast you can either produce a lot of power or you can try to be as efficient as possible and obviously you want to or do both, uh, do both. As you uh, do. <laughs> and then I think it's it's not something that like it's just something that has been gradually progressing over time. I've been very lucky to have a coach that has always, he never knew, like when we first started uh, adventuring into aerodynamics, he we didn't know a lot of uh, things, but what my coach and I, I think are really good at is learning from other people. So in Denmark, we have a lot of uh, very like we have a, rich, a very rich history in uh, track pursuit. Mm. And so what we did very early was to try to see which people actually helps because in 4,000 meter pursuit, aerodynamics is basically the most important uh, part. And it's so crazy how much effort is mm. being put into that. So we wanted to see which people actually help those guys and we got contact with some of them and started working with uh, especially one of those uh, guys and from there on it kind of just took one step at a time and mm. and it's really just working with people that are excellent at, at their what they are doing I think it's so fascinating to to be able to learn from a guy like uh, Martin that we are uh, what he's called that we're working with and just putting on layer and layer and in the beginning it was I remember when we were aero testing it's like <laughs> I would went, go to the track and I found 15 watts and it's like <laughs> and now I go to the track I found find absolutely nothing one day and then I can be lucky the like two two uh, attempts after and find a little gain so it's like getting smaller and smaller mm. but we still see and I have the data all the way back to see so see what my CDA was when we started all this and comparing to now it's mm. it's it's really fascinating insane uh, every time we go and test a new suit or mm. anything like up to a, a, like big, a big ra <laughs> a big race and we're looking at the computer <laughs> yeah. and then you see the graph that is uh, clearly a, a difference and you're like oh my god yeah. Yeah. it's just uh, the best day <laughs> so we've had a we've had a short chat about numbers in um, yeah basically all of the the disciplines the the difference of the level of the uh, like there's just been a world record in the marathon for example what that takes compared to swimming what they're doing the times they're doing compared to cycling 
Um, obviously, I know and I felt the power you <laughs> possess, and um, I'm kind of curious to know if you would ever consider um, like trying out cycling as a as a sport. Sure, uh, cycling. It's a difficult one. It's like I think I could probably. Uh, do it as a time trial specialist or one of those guys that just pulls the peloton uh, for 100 k's uh, mm. with a lot uh, still a lot to go on the stages the uh, yeah but it's i think for to be a competitive cyclist uh, obviously i'm also uh, uh, i want to win mm. uh, so i think it will be difficult for me to become, for instance, winning uh, stage races and also with the technical uh, aspects of sitting in a peloton and going down the mountains like they do. It would probably require a lot of years of, mm. of trying. So I think yeah, So the demands are the, different. The demands different. are just so much different than what we actually train at and you. We are really good at pushing uh, like an even or close to even uh, pace for the entire uh, bike ride in an, an Ironman, but what they actually do is just so much different. Mm. Uh, so I think it's it's realistically it's probably not going to happen, and it's not something I would say that is really motivating me actually to to try out. So I I don't think you know. Cool. Maybe so more. Like going to the track would probably be quite cool seeing not becoming like a full time cyclist, but mm. at one point trying to do an hour attempt. Yeah, like a project. Like the project to see mm. how far, far can I actually go and then in that process learn mm. so much that I can then afterwards transfer into triathlon would probably be something I would consider for sure and something we've already thought about but it's just so expensive uh, and yeah and especially now when all the all the things we uh, all the races all the stuff we can yeah, do it's, it's difficult to find time and yeah yeah speaking of keeping you motivated um, trying to move a little bit away from uh, from all the kind of sports talk um, now the interview gets uh, <laughs> completely out of uh, now, get, now, now get out, gets out of hand. Um, yeah, so let's say I'll give you hundred thousand dollars to start a company to build a business. What kind of business would that be? Uh, it would not be a business. I think <laughs> I'd probably just spend them on some cool experiences. Uh, it doesn't really motivate me to become rich or trying to, uh, then you wouldn't uh, have started triathlon. <laughs> I mm. think it's like, I would probably use them on like doing some things with the people I care about instead of trying to pursue a dream of earning a lot of money has never really been so, that. Uh, so speaking of problems like you, uh, you spoke about with the engineering stuff, is there a problem you would like, you would like to try and solve um, and you could spend that money like a qu some kind of questions you would find answer about uh, obviously being here in Lanzarote and experiencing experiencing how the weather has been absolutely changing I've not been on Lanzarote for a lot of years but mm. still like we've been here I've been here now for three weeks and it's been insanely hot and and some strange weather conditions with sandstorm coming from Sahara, which is when you speak to all the local people, they say it's very unusual and never happened like 15 years ago. So it's quite crazy to think of that's kind of seeing the climate changes on first hand mm. and people that say it doesn't exist <laughs> to my, in my opinion it's like you can also just see it back home in Denmark where we, we live I believe it's that's probably some things that could be I have absolutely no idea where where to start but but it's something that affects us also the we as triathletes and mm. and just people in general I think could be uh, maybe one thing yeah, we've seen it firsthand in St. George for example yeah, that was, yeah, uh, yeah. We've tried racing, uh, or oh, I didn't the, the, the second time, but uh, racing the 70.3 Worlds with uh, 
like the one day it's uh, it's 20 to 30 degrees the next day it's like hail and uh, almost uh, snow uh, coming actually going up snow canyon so it's just it's crazy how how it can just flip completely um, in short, such a short span of time mm. um, so that, that was a, definitely a good one Another one, how old were you when you moved out uh, <laughs> you of your dad and mom's place? You only put that in because you know I haven't <laughs> moved, moved out yet. <laughs> uh, so everyone, I'm still living at my parents' home uh, <laughs> and will probably do that still for some years. But uh, yeah. At to least my, it's not, to my you're defense, not living in the basement and no, never comes up. To my defense, I always, I'm very often on the move. so. Mm. Uh, for instance, now when I travel home, I will probably be home for uh, one or two weeks and then move to the next race and then go back. And so it's like I'm very rarely at home for mm. a very long period of time. And and then when I actually get home and get to spend time with my parents, I've never been like I've always heard stories of teenagers growing up really hating uh, like being close to their parents all the time. and. I've always just uh, been very well at uh, yeah, having a good time with my parents and it's never bothered me at all. So, nice. And if you have a relationship like that, then you, I don't feel, really feel the need mm. to actually move out. Maybe if I was at home all the time, I would probably do it, but... Uh, that's yeah. not really the case. I'm traveling more. I think I'm more away from home than I'm actually home, so yeah. So, speaking of traveling a lot, uh, we go to a lot of places all around the world um, and I'm curious to know the most beautiful place you've ever raced a race. Uh, I think there is like two places that comes to mind. Uh, the first one being Kona and the second one Ironman in Cozumel both mm -hmm. last year. Uh, Kona, I didn't really have the chance to enjoy that much the island afterwards because I had a 70.3 worlds after. So I think uh, doing Kona next year, I will definitely plan to spend some time after if, if it's a possibility. And then I went to Cozumel later uh, that year and that was, <laughs> it's like a really crazy and, and lovely, <laughs> very small island. And <laughs> it was actually very good for training also because there was like one road and with the road for cyclists also closed road and the water there was like swimming in the ocean, uh, looking at uh, race and everything it was like really, really beautiful. That, uh, that's what you yeah. dream of. Yeah, that was, it was a good way to even though the race was so terrible, <laughs> like the warmest and it looked most. like on pictures you had like ten years uh, <laughs> older when you raced the race. I caught uh, fifteen I mean, it's fifteen years of my life there. Uh, yeah. So, um, do you do you still have a, do you have one race kind of a bucket list race? You're thinking like that's that's a race I'm definitely gonna do before I I retire. Uh, yes, I think I have two. Uh, the one, first one being Ironman in Copenhagen. Yeah. I would really like to try and win that one. My coach won it as a professional himself and he has always been telling me stories about how special that was mm. and how it, like, he was coming from behind on the run and how it just gave him wings with having you're running in the center of Copenhagen, which is basically where very close to where we both uh, grew up. Mm. Uh, and you just know every corner on the bike course and having everyone there. He said that he was just getting splits to the first guy, like all the time, constantly getting pushed uh, throughout. So I think that it, it is one of the most spectacular Ironman races in the world. I think yeah, like right. racing in the capital of, yeah. of a country like I'm pretty sure you also go through uh, the castle where the queen lives and, yeah. and stuff like that. That's it's crazy. Yeah, and then the, the second one being uh, Iron Man here on Lanzarote, mm. I think that would be, <laughs> it's just such a tough uh, landscape and I think it's going to be <laughs> absolutely brutal uh, to compete here. It, it is one of those races where you're like, you want to you wanna compete it, but you definitely also <laughs> want to win it yeah. once, just yeah. to have that kind of ticked on your, uh, yeah, yeah. On your list. Yeah, 100%. So not, not racing. Vacation, a uh, place you've, you've uh, been before that just blew you away completely. Um, I know I've heard you've, uh, you've explored 
uh, some parts of the world uh, mm -hmm. by sea before. Yeah. Um, and I'm pretty curious to know if that's like something that would make it to the list. Yeah, that's definitely one, what comes to mind when I think of uh, vacations. Like before I uh, was uh, into a triathlon and, and started training like really seriously. I, some people in my family, they have a part in a, like a sailing boat and then we would usually come and that boat is like on a traveling all around the world so it goes from Denmark and then around the world and it has done that five times uh, with different people being like captains on the boat and then you can kind of book yourself in from sailing from one place to the other and I've been sailing with that boat uh, I think three or four different times in the Caribbean Sea and in the Seychelles and mm. also but the most uh, incredible thing was in the like uh, some very small uh, islands called Fiji Tonga which is in what is that it's not the Pacific Ocean is that still a hell yeah I've, probably the Pacific yeah the Pacific Ocean uh, which is like the lifestyle when it's like not very high-tech boat but it's you're just 10 people on this boat living and sailing around and you just explore some places you would never go to by foot or if you just travel around in a car so then and you and you have nothing to do except just sailing wherever you want and mm. there is it's just such a stress-free life and there is no internet on on that boat or television or whatever so you really only have you and and nature and the people around you and that is some of the most uh, the best memories I have from vacations. So are you then gunning for the uh, for the cultural stuff when when you get to land? Are you gunning for the 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 cultural churches uh, stuff like that, or is it more like a beach? Uh, yeah, then beach wife? then we would uh, the, when I was in on those small islands, I was we were sailing for two months, and we would sail between all those islands and jump and go uh, onto land on one island not really knowing what is on this island some mm. some of them not even people living there uh, so then you obviously get a lot of uh, experiences with some incredible nature but also going to land and experiences experiencing a completely new culture and seeing how people <laughs> mm. live in those part of the world where they don't have anything except uh, three pigs and, uh, <laughs> and and they provide for their family for us for, from very different uh, ways than we you do in in europe so mm. good it has persp been, perspective it's been very learning uh, for, for me seeing how other people li live and uh, you get very grateful for, for what you have i can tell you <laughs> So speaking of uh, having, having three picks and, <laughs> and not a lot else, uh, now, nah, um, so if you had to choose your own spirit animal, what kind of animal comes to mind? Uh, it's a difficult one, <laughs> I think. Uh, uh, We've just discussed it and uh, we, we came up with uh, Mitch being kind of a lemur. I'm not sure if that's the English word, but uh, you know King Julian from Madagascar. That's definitely definitely Mitch. I would say probably some kind of bird. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, but I I like to. They are sometimes alone traveling, uh, like just flying, looking down on the world, and they must be thinking, what the hell is going on there? And, <laughs> Sometimes I look at the world and I think what uh, what is uh, like can't really follow up with all the stuff that's happening in the world and I you think you should be a poet mate that's beautiful <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so seeing the world from an overview and trying to understand what's going on nice <laughs> they are see. also quite aerodynamic some of the birds yeah that's true sea eagle or something like that yeah. that's uh, <laughs> and some of them are I, I don't know which bird I would be but uh, yeah, the falcon. The falcon is already taken. <laughs> yeah. You can't. You can't uh, have that one. That's Hayden. Hayden Wilds. But uh, yeah, I can. I can follow you on that one. So uh, finishing off with the biggest question um, in my life. Basically, when I was when I was young, I had I had a couple of questions I often ask myself. Speaking age, maybe four to eight. This one is the only thing that kind of stuck. Uh, stuck with me throughout my whole life and that is um, 
Magnus, what's your take on life in outer space? Uh, I should have been studying physics and not, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not chemistry, but I think uh, it's going to be very, like, statistically, if you look at the world, like Earth, planet Earth, and seeing how large universe actually is, that we should be the only living kind of living things out there mm. is uh, statistically I think it's not, not possible. possible yeah and so that's probably my take and yeah it would be cool just to I'm not sure it will be in our age like when we are alive ah, well the Mexicans just release <laughs> release pictures of, uh, of aliens so, uh, you know, it, no. would, it would be really cool we just have to reinstate uh, Donald Trump <laughs> and he will probably show some uh, some classified uh, classified stuff yeah no i think yeah. i think i have absolutely no clue but just statistically uh, what, what i hear is that you are completely <laughs> you're jumping on the on the fan uh, <laughs> or oh, band wagon that's yeah, uh, yeah. i would vote, that's a vote yes. uh, donald trump if uh, <laughs> <laughs> if he's yours if i pictures. was an american <laughs> <laughs> ah cool so magnus <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot thanks a lot for spending time with us um, it was great having you um, and again I've uh, enjoyed the last couple of days so uh, me too stay uh, stay tuned Magnus he will uh, he will be a bigger part in the in the YouTube from from now on um, now you have to because now we promise YouTube <laughs> of course um, it's basically his YouTube channel anyway. and now it is Magnus YouTube channel <laughs>